Hello, Mr. Jaita, how are you? Yes, ma'am, I'm fine. Oh, perfect, so you can hear me clearly. Yes. Thank I you can. very much, we'll start shortly. Okay, no problem. Thank you all for coming back. I hope we will keep our telephones um, uh, off. Yes, um, uh, so, oh, is that yours? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Council, are we ready to continue with this afternoon's witness? If we are, you may proceed, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. The witness <coughs> is on the screen. Um, his name is Mr. Lalo Jaite, a witness who testified. testimony. So today we will sit for about 30 minutes to hear his um, testimony and then proceed with another witness. Thank you. You may proceed accordingly. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Jaite. How are you? Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm fine. Um, thank you very much for um, appearing again before the Commission. I would like to apologize again on behalf of the entire commission. We weren't able to complete your testimony last week, but we will do so this week, um, and we have about 30 minutes to do that. Just um, before you start, let me just remind you that you're still under oath, so you have an obligation to continue telling the truth. Do you understand that? Yes, yes. During your testimony last week, you um, addressed a number of issues, um, including the arrest and um, detention, which led to the deaths, uh, which led to one death, which was um, um, Lieutenant Alma Mane, but it was in connection with um, Lieutenant Landing Sane's arrest, which was led by um, Usman Sonko. You also addressed the issue of April 10 and 11. Um, you told us that in your role at the time, you were in Cuba with, ex, with um, now ex-president um, Yaya Jame, when you received a call from the protocol officer of the former vice president, meaning the vice president at the time, Madam Aysa Tunjai Sedi. And you were informed by the protocol officer, Jobate, that um, the vice president wanted to speak to the president. And it was in relation to the student demonstrations that were taking place that day on April 10th. Um, you explained that when you saw the president and you informed him, he appeared to be panicked and nervous. Um, but he took the phone, and when you stepped outside, you heard him say the words um, that um, I will just quote to be clear. You said you heard him say, take care of these bastards in whatever form, which made you panic and you went to find out about your own relatives um, who were, um, or one particular relative who was a student at the time. So you called your wife in order to um, check on her whereabouts. And you told us what you understood by that, um, by that order, which was it could include everything, including um, killings. After that, um, we were supposed to start talking about your own victimization, what happened to you. And so in view of the time, I will give you the floor so that you can tell the commission about what happened to you, when it happened, who was involved, um, the events as, as they unfolded, as well as the impact of that. Thereafter, the commissioners will ask you questions, and then you will end with a final statement. So you have the floor, Mr. Jaite. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, before I go to that, I will just call your attention to this Cuba episode where I mentioned Ablai Kujabi's name. 
And then after a second thought, I, it looks like Ablai was not himself present. But is, what made me strike his name is the telephone call. He made a telephone call with the president. So just to clear that. And then if there is any... Uh, well, um, in fact, could you just tell us for the record, um, again, who Abdullahi Kujabi was at the time? Yeah. Abdullahi Kujabi is the uh, former National Intelligence Agency director. He is sometimes, because there are three Kujabi brothers who sometimes travel with the president. And then I was thinking that Ablai was physically with us in Cuba, but I later understand that he was not physically, but because of the telephone calls he was, he made with the president that made his name strike in my mind. So just for the record, I just want to clear that. Thank you very much. So your recollection is that he called, um, the president on April 10, 2000. The, the pre and that's why you the president, his name. Yeah, the president called him. The president, the president called, called him. him. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, please Thank proceed you. and tell us what happened to you. Ma'am, it was in June, I think around June on the 20, when I was informed by the former commander, ex-Lieutenant Usman Sonko, to report to the Army headquarters and then to be informed about my transfer. And I reported to the army headquarters and one, I was first reported to the state house. We did the normal movement then to the army headquarters. And the second day, that was going to be a 22nd of June. While at home, I got a knock at my door and then I opened the door. I saw for almost five soldiers, five to seven soldiers standing at the door in mask. They are all dressed in mask. And then immediately I opened the door and AK-47 was pointed to my forehead and I was informed to be arrested. And then I was tempted to fire because I was myself armed at the moment. The movement of my hand towards my hip to pick my pistol, my hand was on the head of my three-year-old son, Modulamin who unknowingly followed me to the door. And something just tell me immediately, don't fire, because if you fire, they will kill the whole family. And I decided to raise my hands up, and I decided to subdue because of the safety of my family. From nowhere, I saw my wife just jumped on one of the soldiers called Ali Ubojan, because even with the mask, I could recognize Ali Ubojan's physique. So my wife jumped on her, on him, called him so fearlessly and says, no, my husband is not going anywhere. And I told my wife, please take it easy. Take care of yourself. Take care of the family while I'm away. Ma'am, I think at this moment, at this point, I will, before I go forward, I will just thank my, my wife, Bintu Keita, alias Bintu Lalo Jaita. She fought very hard. She fought with the police. You fought with the military, the soldiers. Uh, she visited every corner for five good months to see to read that I and my friend Omar M. Dabo, people can set their eyes on us and our case to be treated with the respect it deserves. And they succeeded with the wife of Omar M. Dabo, Ajifatu Jain, to make sure after five months, we were able to be seen by people, our families. And then there is not only them. You have my wife, Ajifatu, um, Madam Yabo, Hadi Yabo, the wife of Marena, and then Momudubaro. They all tried. But what, is, what strike me most is for the next 12 months, my wife and Aji were every day visiting us at Maltu Central Prison for two, for two times a day. Then after 12 months, we insisted that two, two times a day is, 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 is too much. They should visit us one day. They never relented. For all this time that we were in Maltu Prison, every day they, the first mission is to see to it that we are in good health, we don't die, we are alive. I really will thank each and everybody who helped in whatever way in my problem. But these ladies, I must say, they are the heroes. 
Then, can, can you tell us a little bit about um, the first time that you were told you were under arrest? You mentioned recognizing one person, um, Ali Ubojang. Did they tell you the reason for your arrest at the time? Actually not. There was, ma'am, there was no time for that. They, the AK-47 was in front of me, and I was in a situation where there was no, they didn't tell me, they just tell me you are under arrest. And then I moved with them to the car where I recognized other people like uh, Sergeant Um, unfortunately, we can't hear the witness, Obi Van. Uh, Mr. Jaite, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you please repeat um, what you said? Uh, you said you moved closer to the vehicle. I believe you might have said it was a van, and you recognized some other people, and then we couldn't hear you after that. Yeah, they took me from the door, from the house, they took me to the car. Then uh, at the car, they put a handcuff on my hand, and then I could recognize people like um, Sergeant Paul Bojang. I could recognize uh, Sidi Balde. I could recognize also Francisco Caso. And in the car, I could also recognize a uh, couple Lamin Senghor called Assassin. And then uh, what I could also say is Sergeant Bojang told me, sir, you know, if we are told to come and arrest you, we will do so. But I'm very grateful that you, your reaction was really very calm. And then we drove to Banju. Um, before you proceed further, Mr. Jaite, you mentioned a Francisco Caso. Um, and you mentioned that your arrest was on the 22nd of June 2000. Can you tell us who is Francisco Caso? Fran Francisco Caso is an Italian. He is an Italian citizen who came to the Gambia and then he was brought to Kanilai. Yaya Jame brought him to Kanilai to train some soldiers. And then uh, that time Yaya was having this idea of creating a group this, that can do his dirty jobs. And then this group happened, later happened to be the junglers. The, the group Francisco trained at that moment, because when I was having this problem, Francisco already trained a group in Kanilai. And then this group is not the junglers as per se, but the idea from Yaya Jame is to create a group we can uh, do some notorious job for him. So Francisco Caso was brought in to train them. Um, and this was in June 2000. So the information we have is that um, the training of the junglers came much later on, 2003, 2004. But you, what you're saying is that as of June 2000, um, the former president, Yaya Jame, already had the idea to train a group that would then um, be his own, basically his own group. Exactly. In 2000, it, it, it doesn't, these are not the junglers as per se. These are not the junglers that we know, like the junglers who appear before you, the commission. Those people were not in this group at that time. But it is the idea for Yaya to have a group trained. So he was starting from 2000. Of course, I, I, I sent you a message where that group which was trained in 2000 was led by one officer. The name maybe I may withheld because you have the message with you. But they are not the junglers as we know, as the Gambian people know. And so maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, because we do not have that information. Um, as of June 2000, um, you've already mentioned Francisco Caso being at your arrest. And so the information you've provided meant that he was already in contact with the former president prior to that. And he had already conducted some form of training. Do you know how the former president came into contact with Francisco Caso? And, um, under what circumstances, what was the arrangement that this individual um, would then come to the Gambia and then offer training to uh, military um, officers? Francisco Caso, I first saw him at the State House with uh, Ablai Kujabi, National Intelligence Agency Director. They came there to see the president. Then we were in Banjul. 
Then we, because at that time we are not staying permanently in Banjul because the, the buildings were being renovated. So we, moved, we were in Kanilai. So after some time, we saw uh, Francisco Caso in Kanilai, and we were told that he is coming to train soldiers. That was the time before I got a problem. And then a group was selected, and he was training them. By June at that time, the time I was leaving, the training was even finished. And I could even remember I had a series of problems with Francisco because I used to send him away from the, the convoy, away from the president's compound, because I had no military communication. No communication came from the army that he's officially coming to train the soldiers. He has contact with Ablai Kujabi and the NIA. So I decided to keep him at an arm's length. When you say you decided to keep him at an arm's length, does it mean that he was trying to be closer? And if yes, what kind of activities was he, tra was he trying to engage in? Yeah, he was trying to be closer to the president. He was trying to know everything about the president. He, even the president's house is in the Dobong, the uh, other the village. He was trying to know I land. He was visiting and knowing all those things. But to me, what was important is that as long as the army doesn't send any official message concerning him, I don't have want to have to do, I don't want to do anything with him operationally concerning the president. So I can even remember, I do tell soldiers to stop him not to enter the inner compound of the president. And when the convoy is moving, if sometimes he tried to be part of it, I always stop him from being. But that was also started when the first day we met, the guy was having a radio in his pocket, a, red, red, a tape recorder, but most of the soldiers don't know, don't see. It. So from there, my suspicion became increased. But I stopped sending him away when one day I told the president, this man is not a soldier, but he called me in the office and told me, Lieutenant Jete, Francisco Caso and his team, his training are under me directly. You have nothing to do with them. They are under me and they take their orders from me. Then the training was not finished. So, yes. Um, so just to be clear, you're saying that um, former President Yaya Jame called you and told you directly to stay away from Francisco Caso because him and the men um, Francisco Caso was training were under Yaya Jame. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, exactly. It, Do you recall it, any of the me. names of the people that Francisco Caso was training as of um, 2000? Okay, the, most of the names I really forgot, but uh, there was this officer, I, I wrote the name to you uh, in an SMS. I don't know whether you remember, he's living in America now, but he was not part of the junglers. He was just part of this group, the first group that... Uh, they think Francesco Caso can train. Well, I don't think there's any need to um, keep his name confidential unless no. there are any security, there are security reasons I'm unaware of. So you can mention his name or I can provide it to you and you can confirm whether or not that is accurate. Yes, uh, the, the officer in, uh, in that team was uh, Lieutenant Wali Nyang. He was the officer, the head of the group that Francisco Force Group was training. But as I said, as I said, the Force Group that Francisco trained was actually not this jungler thing as we know, because at that time, this jungler killing and all those things did not start. So, so it was pretty he was much part the of idea the... of it at the time. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps we'll move on. Um, We'll move on and continue with your arrest. You told us that you were arrested at your home. This was the 22nd of June 2000. And then you were taken um, to detention. Can you tell us exactly where you were taken and um, what the conditions were? Um, I was taken to the NIA headquarters. And then uh, I was dumped in a, in a cell, in a very dark cell, and they closed the door. And then this cell was really, there was no light. There was no window. 
it was really smelling from from urine and feces and there are pots around where people you i could see urine in pots i mean uh, that means people there when people come there when they are about to ease themselves they just do the urine in that pot and those things were really stinky there was no bed no mattress no blanket i just saw some cartons cut of cut some small small piece of cartons i just put them together and just uh, was uh, lying on that even though I'm not, i was not sleeping then uh, the following day mm -hmm, the no, follow please, please proceed the following day then i they opened the door and they took me i don't know whether down or up but i saw myself in a hall where i met uh, people uh, gentlemen waiting for me and they were to interrogate me and then uh, they interrogated me first they asked me what what why i am here i said i don't know but i was thinking that because there were some small uh, the president was angry about me on that uh, days before i leave kanilai concerning about some things that he bought and i decided to change those things because of the prices because to me he was buying it for a house where and the office where i am going to be like an air condition and office this and the supplier was going to bring the materials which are very expensive and i told the supplier look i don't need those type of expensive air condition so i made the supplier to change the office material and the air condition and the president was really very angry about that so i told the ni i think this is the problem i had i can remember i have with the president but they later informed me that uh, i was arrested concerning a coup d'etat which was about to be organized by my cousin called uh, ex former captain alaji kante and then uh, that's why i was arrested so i said i don't know anything about that and then uh, they later allow me to write my statement to about about the so just very briefly on that, do you recall anyone um, that you spoke to at the NIA who was asking you those questions? Yeah, it was uh, many people, but among them, the one I could remember actually was Sukuta Jame. Sukuta Jame I could remember because I think I, I, think I saw him once. And but, uh, no, uh, during, the, during the interrogation, his name came up once. So that stick in me. And then that is the only one I could remember. But he was really very respectful. He did not harm me. He did not insult me. But I could remember his name. And for how long did you stay at the NIA? I think at the NIA, I stayed almost uh, five to six days, if I could remember, because uh, we were. Please continue. Five to yeah, I think I, uh, five to six days. That was uh, on the 38th day of June. We were picked up by military police to the Carnifee Magistrate Court, where I was uh, charged for treason and remanded in mile to prison. And then uh, the military police took us back to, took us to the mile to central prison. And where um, were we, you kept at mile two? Yeah, we were kept, kept at the maximum security wing. But I just wanted to say something. At the NIA in the cells, I could not remember an official uh, mailing system. But I wanted to just express my gratitude to a friend called Ablai Gay, who was working with the NIA, who used to bring me food, even though I don't have appetite. And uh, one soldier called Yanku Bature at the State House, who once wanted to cry in front of my cell because of my condition and he wanted to bring food. I sent him away, I said, go away because if this your friends, they see you crying here, you may end up in the same cell which I am. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, those things also. So at the mile to central prison, we were taken to maximum security wing and I was uh, kept in the cell number one. This, this cell is just, is the one near the gallows, because before there was a, a place called gallows, during 1981 or so, my cell was near that, and also near Sana Sabali's cell. Another terrible, horrible cell, without light, 
without window, no blanket, no, the bed is out of a concrete slab, and then uh, no mosquito net. It is just a horrible cell. And then I spent the first night there, the following morning I wake up, the whole cell was white from salt and water because the salt water was coming from underground and then the whole floor of the cell was wet. And this is the cell I spent almost one year in and then moved to another cell, I think cell number two. Cell, it was um, sown at the GRTS after the, after the changes. I think the Minister of Interior, my father visited um, GRT, uh, prison and he saw that cell on GRTS. This is a cell I was living in myself for almost two, 24 months. How and much then, time uh, did you spend at um, mile two? How long was your detention? Our detention, I think, was about three years, one month, eight days. I can remember if, I, if, I, if my memory can serve me well. You told us that you were charged with treason. Um, can you tell us um, what the outcome of that case was? Yes, I w we were charged with treason, and I was not alone. Omar M. Dabo, ex-Lieutenant, Momodu Dumo Saho, Mr. Momodu Marena, Mr. Ibrahim Yabo, Mr. Ibrahim Barrow, and one Mr. Ablai Sanya was also arrested where the state wanted to use him as a state witness, and he decided to leave the country, but he was not with us. He was at the NIA, so he decided to um, elude them and leave, let the, leave, let, left the country. And then, as I said, Cap, former Captain Alaji Kante was also accused, but he was able to elude the authorities uh, when they went to arrest him and then he left the country. So the decision was we were going to court, my uh, high court, because it was a treason. And then the military police was picking us and bringing us to and fro, where I should also be thankful to ex-Lieutenant Lamin Combo, who was military police, and then ex-general, former General uh, Savage, who used to pick us. And they were really very respectful, and they gave us our due. So I just wanted to call them out here. Um, we went to court. I could remember uh, one time Justice Grant was the our judge. And then he one time told the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecution, that if they are not serious with the, the court case, he is going to throw it out. And then they took it away from him, and we had to sit for seven months until it was then given to Justice Ahmed Belgori who um, in Ju July, I think, uh, July, what is the date? Would that be 20? Um, yeah, some, July 28, and then uh, 2003, he decided, uh, Ahmed Belgor, out of blue, because he told the prostitution, I cannot, I will not keep these people longer if you people don't bring me evidence. If you bring me evidence and they're guilty, I'm going to put them to death. But if you don't bring me um, um, evidence, I'm going to release these people. And then they could not bring any evidence. And then uh, all of a sudden the justice told them, please allow me for 30 minutes. And he went to his chambers and came back in 30 minutes and decided to acute us, acute and discharge. I was surprised. I was crying because I never thought, I never thought that somebody will be brave enough, like Justice Grant, may his soul rest in peace, and Justice Ahmed Belgo, to be true to their professional principles of fairness. This really surprised me, but I'm very grateful for their service. And so in fact, after being in detention for over three years, you were acquitted and discharged. Can you tell us what impact this had on you, had on your family? You talked a little bit about your wife earlier. What impact did it have on your family? It was, <clears throat> it was a tough situation. And then until now, I cannot even imagine how my wife, young as she was, unexperienced as she was, because we married at a young stage, how she was able to cope. But she promised me after five, five months during the incommunicado, 
that I will do everything possible to stand behind you. It was tough. See, it made me to be strong with all those horrible conditions in mile two. Because of her, I'm strong. And my family members also. My parents, my extended family members, my good friends. I may not, I, I used to tell my wife, definitely I did not do what I'm supposed to do for, for some of the friends and the family members until now. But I have them in my mind and I'm happy of what they have done to me. It was a real tough thing for my, my, my wife and the family, but thank God she was able to take care of my, fam my, my, my family. Yeah. And in fact, after you were released, um, how soon after did you leave the country? Because of course you told us in your previous testimony, well, your testimony last week, that you're in Switzerland. So just um, briefly tell us about um, that and then um, I will conclude. Yeah, we were released on the 28th, uh, 2000 of July. We were expected to go home, but we came back to mile two and we realized that we have to spend a night in mile two after being acute and discharged. Just simply because of one wicked senior prison officer. He was a deputy officer. His name is Yaya Jaju. He never wanted to see us go home. We spent the night there and the following day he took us to army headquarters, thinking that the army will take us for court marshals. When we arrived at Babukar Jata's office, the then chief of staff, Babukar asked him, why are you bringing these people here? He point blank told Babukar, I thought you are going to bring them to court marshal because the court, then Babukar Jata told him, look, the court released these people, go back home, go back to the prison, release them, let them take their properties back and go to their families. We have nothing to do with their case. I thank Babu Karajata for that bold decision also. And then I was there in um, Gambia, I think for almost one or two months, which I felt very unsafe because I felt being followed anywhere I go to. And then I could see people following me in suspicious uh, situations. And I decided to leave the country and went to Senegal to try to find a way to go to Switzerland. And when did you, in fact, um, go to Switzerland? In uh, Switzerland, I arrived here, I think it was in January, January 30, 30th, if I could fully remember, 2004. I arrived here, January 2004. And another mm -hmm. question for you. At the time that you were arrested, you were serving in the military. After you had spent over three years in detention and then you were acquitted and discharged in relation to um, treason charges, were you reinstated back in the military? What happened to your career? What, when we were released, actually before I go, we, were, we went back to the army as normal because we were not dismissed at that moment from the military. So we were given two weeks uh, holiday. And I went to Badibu, to the provinces, to meet my family. I think it was on the 8th of August, 2003. Then uh, Omar Dabo, my friend, called me to say I have to come back because he received a letter that we are discharged because of security reasons. So I came back. Then we were discharged. Then uh, that was the time uh, I decided, after some time, I decided to leave the country to go to Senegal. But ma'am, I will take also this opportunity to thank my lawyers, lawyer Usman Silla, lawyer Usainu Dabo, lawyer Maifat, and all the lawyers, because we had, when we have a case, you have the courthouses full of lawyers. Most of them are doing it pro bono. I am very grateful to them and my family thank them also. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jaitia, thank you very much, um, and thank you again for your patience. Um, I have concluded. I will hand over to the chairman in case there are any questions from the commissioners, and then you will be given the opportunity to make a brief final statement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, too. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Mr. Council, and thank you, Mr. Jaite, for your testimony, and thank you for agreeing to come back. Sorry we couldn't complete it um, the other day because of the technical difficulties that we had. Commissioners, if you have any questions, please indicate. Otherwise, um, I will ask Mr. Jaite if he has any closing remarks to make to do so now. Mr. Jaite, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I hope I have a short one. Of course, I will do. Because what I'm going to say is all based on fairness. When we have a variety, we will always pro pro progress. Mr. Chairman, wherever there is the word called change, improvement, reconciliation, it means there is something undecidable on hand on something on hand or it has happened. And it means the people also deserve more than what they are having. And if, if the people want to have what they deserve, I think they should be determined for a change. And I always believe the determination to change should be informed by the history, what happened to the people and the society. This determination should also be strengthened with our commitment for the golden rule of fairness. That is, what is not good for me should not be good for another person. And we understand that we are one and one, one people, the same brothers and sisters. And together, we can make changes towards a better society. I believe one of the roots for we Gambians, for a better society, a healing one for that matter, is through this TRRC, Truth, Reconciliation, Reparation Commission. The essential of this commission is to revisit our history, what has happened to us, look at it, learn from it, by the citizens telling the truth. When we learn from it with the spirit of reconciliation and our commitment towards a better society and a fair society, the necessary, with the necessary reparation, a history will be written in which is nothing other than your recommendation. And that recommendation, I think, will be respected and accepted by the people. I am not naive that a life lost really is not reparative. But I believe if we are able to tell the truth, if Yaya Jame was be taken to justice, his properties are being confiscated, and at least the life loss will feel that there is a reparation. I am telling my fellow citizens, I always say, there was no civil war in the country. There was no tribalism in the country. That was just a foolish propaganda Yaya Jame was using to divide us as a nation. It was not between the Jolas and the Mandinkas, it was not between the Fullers and the Wallers. It was Yaya Jame alone and few of his bad soldiers who strangulated the country to the point of suffocation. If Yaya Jame is brought to justice, his properties, as I said, are confiscated and the victims' families are put into consideration and their rep reparation, proper reparation is done. I believe the country could heal. And that will also serve as a lesson to our present and future politicians to know that our institutions should be nurtured and invested in. Because this is important because institutions bring decencies to society. Therefore, it needs us as a people to operate them in fairness. For if our institutions are operated in fairness, the rule of law will be respected, people's rights will be respected, the rights of association, people's right to speak, freedom of speech will all be respected, and then that is a recipe for a country to be developed. Mr. Chairman, I also have a fear. I hope not. I am confident that you people are going to create a recommendation, as I say, that will be respected and will be accepted. But I only hope the government will not come out with a white paper just like what has happened to the Janet Commission, the Financial Journalist Commission, where they're going to create a selective justice. I hope that will not happen, because if that happened, the country will not heal, will still continue hating each other and then angry. My last point is for the army. My former comrades, the Gambian National Army, please let us be wise. Let us be wise. Any politician who uses his army towards his people is a selfish politician. So let us, not, let us not allow the institution to be used again by our politicians. 
because Yaya Jame used this institution for his errands with only 0.00% of the military, because the army also has good people, but he used them against the army itself. Can we imagine how many soldiers were butchered? How many soldiers lost their job? And how many soldiers were in exile? How many soldiers were, were in prison? It's too much. At the end of the day, what has Yaya Jame done? He left the people, the people that have, were even doing the bad things for him, and he's gone. And I'm quite sure when he is facing justice, he will deny that he is the one who ordered these um, atrocities. So let the Gambian National Army know that we are being paid, they are being paid by the citizens, and their loyalty is not for anybody, but for the citizens. And they will come in only when there is a state of emergency. So please, let the Gambian National Army learn. Let them respect themselves. Let them respect the institution. Let them know what has happened. If that happens, Mr. Chairman, I'm quite sure the Gambia is not divided as we think. We will, we will survive. Long live Gambia. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Jaite, for those very wise um, uh, remarks. And uh, again, um, we are very grateful that you have found time to come and testify before the Commission. Thank you again very much, and uh, au revoir. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. De rien. Merci. Alors, Merci. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Council, are we ready with the uh, next witness? Yeah, yes, Mr. Chair, we are ready to proceed with the next witness. Thank you. Uh, may I ask the officer to call in the next witness? Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I just ask that... Uh, the videos be Yes, the TVs, if you could just put them down. And yes, just push, push this, the other one, and the one on top of the table, put it down. Uh, and thank you. I, I said, Do swear that. Do swear that. I'll, speak the truth. I'll speak the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth. and nothing but, and nothing but the truth. So help me, so help me God. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you may be seated, madam. No problem. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Jai Saidi. Afternoon. Uh, welcome to the TRRC. Thank you. Uh, as you are aware, mm. 
our country went through difficult times mm -hmm. over 22 years of what is called the Jame dictatorship. Uh, this country has deemed it necessary to go to embark on a soul-searching mission aimed at trying to identify or aim at trying to come up with the truth about what happened in the country during this period with a view to establishing a true historical record of what has happened so that it would pave the way for the country to come back and heal as a nation. We reconcile and try to honor or give reparation to those who have been victimized. That is the whole essence of this exercise. It is no witch hunt. It is only aimed at trying to establish the truth. In that context, I would encourage you, in view of the position you had occupied in this country, to assist your country by speaking the whole truth about what you know to have occurred in the past. Are we together? Um, and uh, Madam Vice President, if you, I would encourage you to indicate by making a statement uh, when you agree or disagree uh, with a proposition. If you nod, uh, we would know what you mean, but it would not be reflected okay. on the record. All right. And uh, uh, perhaps may I also suggest that you draw the microphone closer to you uh, so that um, you would not strain by lean, leaning forward. But feel, uh, organize it uh, as you wish. Just feel as comfortable as possible. Mm -hmm. Before I start, I want to warn that it is a criminal offense in this country to lie under oath. It is also an offense to lie to the TRRC. Uh, in that regard, I would encourage you to be as truthful as possible. Are we together? Um, oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, kindly tell us your full names, please. Yes, Mr. Jai Sidi. When were you born? 1952. Could you give us a full date, please, if that is possible? 15th March, 1952. And where were you born? Punta West, North Bank region. Uh, thank you very much for precise answers. I would suggest that uh, you allow for a brief moment, uh, at least three seconds between our speeches, so that our statements or speeches would not overlap, because okay. we have uh, interpretation that is mm -hmm. ongoing. Mm -hmm. Could you briefly give us a summary of your educational and professional background. Uh, we are running short of time, yeah. so we can uh, go through that very quickly. Thank you, Ma. Yeah, I started really by primary education uh, in Brikama Primary School, 1959 to 1964. I hope I'm not going fast for translation. Oh, you, that, uh, that is good okay. speed. Okay. From 1964 to 1970, Amitage High School. 1970 to 71, on unqualified teaching at Birkama. They used to call it post-primary school, later junior secondary school. Then, 1971 to 1974, Yundum Teacher Training College, where I did the unqualified teacher training course for three years. 1974 to then I completed, went back again to become a junior secondary school until 1976. And uh, from 1976 I went to the Indigenous Business Advisory Service, Ibas, until 1983. But during the summers, of course, of 1971 to 76, when I was a teacher, I always have holidays, and I used to teach the American Peace Corps on language and cross-cultural training. 
Then in 1983, in August 1983, I was appointed as Deputy Executive Director of the Women's Bureau under the Minister of, of course, under the President's Office at the time. It was the First Republic. Then, after that, I was appointed as Acting Executive Secretary around 1990-91, around that time, up to 1992-93, something like that. I became the Executive Director of the Women's Bureau after that, until the advent of the July 22nd, 1994, coup d'etat. In 1996, I mean, it started in 19. It could have found me at the Women's Bureau, actually. But in 1996, somewhere there in the middle, I was appointed as Minister of Health, Social Welfare, and Women's Affairs. And later as Vice President in 97, around there, as Vice President and uh, Secretary of State for Women's Affairs and Social Welfare as well as Health. Then, as Vice President, they, they took out Health, Health was taken out and I became only Vice President and Minister of Women's Affairs until the advent of the Third Republic. That's January. Uh, 2017. Yeah. Th thank you very That's much. That's a resume anyway. Thank you but very much. I can't go through all the educational things. There are many, but I can drop thank that you. out. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you can tell us briefly uh, about your higher education, just briefly. Uh, briefly, I did uh, in the Netherlands, I did an advanced training in industrial management course, postgraduate. Uh, they call it the postgraduate diploma course. And in short, I also did the master's course, MSc, in Economic and Social Studies in uh, Wales, the University of Wales in Swansea. For short, there are others, but you can <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Vice President. Mm -hmm. uh, from what we have heard, you have served in the JAMI administration mm -hmm. for 20 years. Well, about that, maybe. It's 76, Pro sometime in 76. From yeah. 1996 yeah, somewhere in, yeah. to the end 2016 yeah, yeah, and yeah. 2017. Yes, that's right. That's 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we can safely say that you are the longest serving mm -hmm. government minister, mm -hmm. perhaps in the history of the Gambia. Mm -hmm. Is that, I yes, think, yes, yes. I, I mean, think yes, that is yeah. right. Yeah. And uh, the topics I want to talk to you about mm -hmm. is mainly or principally mm -hmm. April 10 and 11, mm -hmm. 2000. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, mm -hmm. there are a few things, mm -hmm. thematic issues I would wish to discuss with you. Mm -hmm. And the first, perhaps you may keep a list if you want, uh, but uh, I would raise them. But you raise them one after the uh, other. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but just to put you on notice mm. already, mm. that we would talk about the attack on the media. Mm. We mm. would talk about mm. the attack on political opponents. We will talk about the unlawful arrests and detentions. We will talk about the sackings of civil servants or public officials. Mm. We will talk about the attack on students, that was the April 10 and 11. Mm. We will talk about the false accusations of coup d'etat. We will talk about the activities of the junglers, the false presidential treatment program, the use of the NIA as an instrument of terror, mm -hmm. and Jame's intentions to crown himself king. 
we would talk about those topics, not in too much detail, but briefly, and we would want to hear what you have to say about them. Mm. But let's start with the attack on the students. Mm -hmm. April 10 mm -hmm. and 11, mm -hmm. the year 2000. Mm -hmm. At this time, the evidence we receive is that President Jame was away in Cuba. Yeah. Is that right? That's right. Who was in charge of the country during his absence? Well, he made me acting president. He usually does when he travels. He writes. And uh, what do you understand that to mean? Because he said acting president, something like we send respond for centralized services. Whoever has a problem, they come to you yeah, among the ministries and you help them out. In fact, under our constitution, mm -hmm. acting president means that all the authority that is conferred on the president by the constitution is now bestowed on you? Well, yes, uh, it should be that way. But generally, President Jame, to be honest, was a strong man. You don't, even if he delegates you to do something, you still have to refer back to him. Ah. So you may be de facto, de jure, whatever, acting president. But most of the time, the president can be acting and yet not be absent. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah. That uh -huh. he can make you acting president, but there are a lot of things that have been referred to him, even when he travels. That you cannot take major decisions without his clearance. That I know. Ministries would do that. We would do that. Security, all other arms of government have to clear with him. So in effect, you cannot take the, the, all the decisions. I think one day, I don't know whether Gambians remember when he said, the vice president comes to me for everything. You see, I've even given her the acting, but I knew why I did that. And I knew why others also do that. Because you would have that responsibility, but to be honest, you have to clear most of the things with him. Uh, Especially uh, the, major decisions, you uh, can't take them. That may very well be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. until you refer to him, mm -hmm. you are in fact the president. Yeah, 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 sure. And the book at that point would stop with you. Sure, sure. Perfect. So tell us what happened mm -hmm. in the days leading up to April 10th and 11th, 2000. What happened before April 10th, I only heard it here. I didn't know. As I said, to be honest, what I told the investigators is what I know. What I knew, I didn't know of any pre-existing problems between students and government or students and whoever. Maybe the ministry would know, the Ministry of Education. Maybe others would know. Maybe the government knew, some other sectors of government. But the only time I knew about April 10th and 11th was when I went to see of the president at the airport. And that's where message got, you know, when the president talks to you, he do, you don't go directly and talk to him. He sends messages. So whoever sent the message to my protocol, I don't know. But the message reached my protocol at the airport that I should talk to the students because they have issues to talk about. They have certain concerns. That's all they told me. Uh, uh, at this stage, as vice president of the country, mm -hmm. didn't you know that there was a problem in Birkama? I didn't. I was told af during the demonstration. After the demonstration, the security briefed me, yes. Then I knew. Did you at any stage hear mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. a student called Ibrahim Abari was killed or died in Birkama? I only knew when the demonstration happened and they explained that to me, yes. The security told me. Did you hear before that day that a girl from Birkamaba Secondary School was allegedly raped at the independent that stadium? That also the, the security told me when Ma the demonstration uh, happened. Ma Madam Vice President, did you read the newspapers about what was happening in your country? But you know, newspapers, let me tell you, uh, there was a time government also didn't allow us to <laughs> buy newspapers in the, or read them in the office. You remember that was a government law at one time, that you cannot have access to certain newspapers, except the government one, I don't, I don't remember, my news bulletin or whatever they call it. My worry is that from the outset of your testimony, mm -hmm. this theme that you did not know 
-hmm. what was happening in the country mm -hmm. would in fact become a major theme. Yeah, I didn't know why, because me, I'm always, my office, my, my house, my office, my house. I don't go to booths or bantabas or listen anywhere else. But, but Madam Vice so President, I didn't know. one did not have to go to a voo or a bantabas. I'm just giving an example. To know issues of national interest. But what I'm saying, I didn't know. I, I leave it to the commission to believe that I lied or I said the truth, but I'm telling you what I know. No, it's not about lying. Yeah, I, I didn't know. I, I, I do not for a moment believe that you are lying but i, I am concerned that as vice president of the country you did not know issues of grave concern to the population well i didn't know to be so I'm or, sorry all right, but let, I didn't. let us move on let us move on mm -hmm. so you were tasked to talk to the students mm -hmm. and you did not know anything about what the issue no was. no i didn't they said they had concerns okay proceed please mm -hmm. they said this i had concerns so i said okay i told my protocol since Whatever the president who tells you, maybe it's an urgent issue. My was protocol was Babukar Jubati. Thank you very much. Proceed. So I told him, Babukar, you can call up a meeting. Because he told me, usually the message was I should meet them at the Security Council level. So I said, call up the meeting and invite the Security Council, invite um, the Minister of Education, because that's, that's what they told me.